NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly's 10-year anniversary show. Oh, yeah. We're joined by the same, much of the same cast and crew. Uh, Allison Nixon has joined us, for those who hey, have everyone. not seen. Yeah, it's very, very nice to have you yeah. here, hey, Allison. Oh. We miss it's you. so great to be here again. Yes, yes. Aaron Lyons has joined us in studio, filling in as well. He was behind the cameras, now he's in front of the cameras. It's awesome to have you here, Aaron. Thank you. You can catch me weekly on Hack Naked TV. I love it. He has yes. an instant <laughs> plug right there. Plug, hey, plug. Very well done. Yeah. And before I forget, I, I think we have to owe a huge debt of gratitude to the folks that are behind the scenes. Mm. Uh, Chris and Nick, Aaron. Aaron. Yeah, thanks, all, guys. All, all the guys that, Cheers. that make all the things happen behind the scenes. And you know, a lot of this, you know, yeah, a lot of this wouldn't be possible except we'd be back at your pool table. That's right. And <laughs> this is true. And we've now, come so far in 10 years looking back at that and... Without I, these guys, in the early days, we were the ones like Aaron behind yeah. the camera and in front of the camera. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to do yeah. two jobs. Let's face yeah. it, right? What I was going to say, a lot of this not necessarily wouldn't be possible. A lot of this wouldn't go near as smoothly. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> and, no, and, I, I would and, say and, it's uh, not even Steve, possible. And, <laughs> yeah. Steve, Steve Rickyberg and yeah, all LA the guys Steve. that all of the behind the scenes that aren't on camera that make all of this stuff happen. And yeah. I think they really need a huge. In the last couple of years, they need a huge round of applause for there's all the things lot, that they do. There's a lot of moving parts here. Oh my gosh! Hey, and man. and, yeah. and hey, quite raise. honestly, Paul, you know, <laughs> in my involvement over the Thanks, number the, the deleted years, um, <laughs> my involvement has been much less in any of that. And to to you personally, I thank you for managing all of that. And you know, we need that's a, a huge. Are, are you saying they do the jobs that we don't want to do? Is that what you're saying? You do. You do. <laughs> like, quite honestly, you do. You do, yeah. and you manage the folks that do the jobs that we don't want to do. Right. And thank you. It's a lot Thank of work. You. A, like you. I said, there's a lot of moving parts going on behind the scenes. And so. We really want to grow the show to the next level. So if you're interested in sponsoring us, you can contact Paul or myself at paul at securityweekly.com or Aaron at securityweekly.com. I'd right. be glad to A lot to of set us do multiple up. jobs, like Aaron yep. is the personality for Hack Naked TV and the sponsor yeah. Wrangler, as we as we call it. So Yeah, exactly. Good. And there, there's yeah, it's so many moving parts and you know, from from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys for for making all that happen. Cheers to that, because we get to sit here and all smoke. Right. And Cheers. 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 Yeah. Cheers. Here's the 10 years. Mm. 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 On the lines via Skype, to help us out with our mobile security and privacy panel, we've got Simple Nomad, a.k.a. Mark Loveless, who's been doing hacker and security-related things for over 30 years and is now a senior security researcher at Duo Security. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. You Glad and I had a, 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 we got to catch up a little bit at uh, Black Hat, Mark, and it was a, a great conversation. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. I was glad we were able to to get caught up, and I'm uh, very thankful that you're you're here with us uh, today. Cool. Enjoy being here. And a newcomer to the show, Mr. David Schwartzberg, who is a senior security engineer at Mobile Iron. Now, um, David, you have you been a listener for the show? You seem to have some familiarity with it. I've listened before, but uh, today I've been watching a lot more watching the Asadorian Athon go on. It's been pretty <laughs> <Yeah>. fun. <laughs> Asadorian Athon. Well, yeah. David, thank you very much uh, for being with us here today. Certainly, your background uh, in working with Mobile Iron uh, no, will, will I, come in handy. I also want to mention real quick that David's also the founder of uh, Hack for Kids. And at DerbyCon, I got yes. handcuffed. Uh, as a donation <laughs> for Hacker Kids. Okay, wait, where are we uh, going with, with this now? With yeah, no, that was going. And uh, yeah, I had never picked myself out of a ha set of handcuffs before. And it was awesome. Are you I'd, sure about that? And I did it in less than a minute. <laughs> nice. <laughs> hey, I'm so, glad we were able to just have you help you discover that about yourself. Absolutely. New <laughs> skill. Now the next step is do it with a beer behind your back while handcuffed in under a minute. Get out and drink the beer. 
Um, oh, so, we can make that happen. It's, so, uh, David and uh, Simple Nomad, I want to hear from you both because we were talking to Miko Hipponen earlier today, and I wanted to mm-hmm. ask you about some examples of mobile devices that are leading to damages in organizations. If you had any examples of where mobile devices have been hacked, so to speak, uh, and used against an organization or used in some nefarious way. You mean something like, uh, well, I know, like a X code ghost, that whole scenario? Sure. I don't know. I don't know if that's the kind of what you mean. Most of the things I've heard have been anecdotal. Yeah. Uh, and- someone, someone loses their phone. Uh, I mean, you hear these stories about, you know, where someone loses their phone and then next thing you know, they're, uh, uh, they didn't have a good password on it or whatever. And so all of a sudden they're... Uh, all, all the passwords they have on the device allowed for access and to work. Right. So is the, I mean, is the mobile threat, is it, is it a real threat or is it hype? Or like where does this fall in the list of priorities? Definitely not hype. It's definitely real. Um, like Simple Nomad was saying, when it comes to things like loss or theft, those are big concerns for a lot of uh, corporations and organizations. But things like potentially harmful apps, definitely need to be on top of mind. So, for example, I have uh, a sample piece of malware that I've been able to demo live, and it's actually out there on some videos if you want to go watch it at different conferences, where you could intercept the text messages and redirect them to a control phone. And I've even tested that on some uh, newer Android operating systems, and it still worked. Mm. And it's not um, a, a rooted device. It's, it's a stock device or updated to the latest version. And, and so it's a real threat. Now, many of us, like myself, we don't run antivirus software on our phones. (laughs) There's antivirus software for phones? Yeah, exactly. There There is. is. There is, actually. There is. But why why is that? Is it not – is it just not effective? Is it just not practical? What's the the deal with AV software on the the phones? I think it's the same same deal you have with AV software on the desktop, right? We know how that solves all the world's problems. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> well, so. It also goes back to another um, kind of fundamental issue. When, when you look at a mobile operating system, we'll just call them a modern operating system, you really only have like one trusted agent, right? It's not like on a desktop where you can have multiple agents running there and trust them and, and hope they're working together and they're providing layers of protection. protection. So when it really comes to managing those devices, um, that one trusted agent has to do a lot. And if they're really not good at things like detecting malware, then they have to rely on partners to provide those app reputation services. Um, so uh, antivirus software, I mean, we pretty much killed that right from the start, which I think is great <laughs> on the mobile platform. <laughs> <laughs> but when you when you when you talk to C level executives of corporations that are trying to develop policies for mobile devices or BYOD devices, as we call them, they tend to recommend a sandboxing method and uh you know david i know you work for a company that that can accomplish some of that sandboxing um but across the board you know how how well can we sandbox applications and the way i kind of think of it is um you know i i use facebook and twitter on my phone because it's kind of like a necessary evil but what kind of sandboxing technology is out there and how do can we implement these technologies on our mobile devices why well, and and how effective is it and how yeah, yeah is it really truly effective and how resource intensive is it no, there's a yeah, lot good, of questions in there david anything else simple. you want to throw in there come on <laughs> and, and is it secure <laughs> is santa claus real can it make <laughs> toast I damn it larry your kids might be watching Will it bring me happiness? <laughs> define happiness. Will Not it happiness for me? <laughs> Watch the show a little. Um, so anyway, kind of addressing the question about sandboxing. That's one of the challenges, right? The, the different companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, they provide some APIs that a company like MobileIron can write to. But it really goes beyond that. And that's when you need to build something like a sandbox. You need to have... Um, the developers that know the right way to implement things like the crypto, right? You're going to use AES, or you're going to use 256 or 128. Th- that's going to affect certain things, right? It might affect performance. It might affect battery life, but um, also disk space. So typically, a lot of organizations or developers go with 128-bit, 
just again for performance. Um, when it also comes to the effectiveness, that really depends on who you believe has the best approach philosophically. So obviously, I, I believe in my employer's approach, having looked at these different companies prior to working for Mobile Iron, and, and the approach that Mobile Iron takes is really kind of sandboxing the app and the data around it. So this way, if you need to do something like a selective wipe, it's very easy. Or if you just need to wipe the data for one particular app instead of everything in the sandbox, it's not like dropping a nuke in the sandbox because there just happens to be um, you know, like a, a shovel you want to get rid of. Really bad analogy, sorry. Um, so I don't know if that answered all the questions, but I, I guess the, the, the real takeaway for that is you can't rely solely on what the modern operating system providers or, or creators offer. You have to build something else around it. And so, that's pretty complex. And that even includes bolstering your infrastructure with a mobile gateway or a firewall so that the data can traverse securely. Hey, so how, how do, if I may follow on with that, Paul, uh, sure. how do you... Uh... How do you see the, uh, the the contention that arises in organizations between using the sandbox application versus using the native application on the device? I know when we've done assessments in the past, we've had customers that have pushed back and saying, no, I really want to use the native email client. I really want to new use right. this native app on the device. And, and you're actually having to fight against it, say, look, no, you've got to use the sandbox uh, application. You've got to use the application that has this containerized con encryption. Um, can you can you comment on that that uh, resistance that goes on amongst sort of the personal device users uh, versus the sort of corporate pressure to to actually secure the data appropriately? Yeah. Whenever I have that conversation, the first thing I want to make sure is: Do you have your security team in the room? Because it's usually they're not there when they hear that. Um, so we typically want to first find out what their overall objectives are. So if their objective is to maintain the native experience. That might be fine. Maybe they just don't have, uh, or maybe they have a bigger risk appetite for using un uncontainerized email. But a lot of organizations, when they want containerization, they want a full PIM. And, and that's a really nice thing because now your contacts and your calendar and your tasks, your email, the attachments, everything's in there. And it makes it easy to collaborate. Um, I use a combination of both on different platforms. And I find it sometimes pretty cumbersome to leave the containerized app to go to native. And that's one example that I give them. Plus, we just let them test it out. I mean, once they kind of see how easy using a containerized approach could be, it, it kind of helps sway that decision and, and fight that resistance. But if they're dead set on just having the native experience, then we offer things like um, attachment control. So if, if there's something that they want to prevent, for example, an attachment from being opened into another app, then if it's encrypted and it gets opened into uh, some cloud storage provider's app, well, it's going to be encrypted there. So we're helping with the data loss. Um, Mr. Simple Nomad, I wanted to ask you in terms of mm -hmm. mobile security, uh, yes. what do you do to protect your, your own phone? What do you implement in your own uh, kind of operational security to uh, protect your mobile environment? Uh, well, for the most part, I don't run a ton of apps on my phone at all. Uh, I, use, I have most of the stuff turned off most of the time. Uh, such as uh, Bluetooth would be uh, mm. an example of something that I would I would leave off unless I absolutely had to use it. Like if I had to get that music off my uh, phone into my car stereo, right? You know, and then hope I'm not being tailed by evil Bluetooth hackers as I'm driving down the street or whatever. But I mean, for the most part, that's it. I just I barely have any apps loaded on the phone at all. I don't uh, my primary primary email i don't even uh i can't even access it from my phone mm -hmm. Interesting. and i do that on pur i do that on purpose so i'm not tempted mm. hmm. uh, I, I just yeah. i don't want to have to deal with it yeah you know, just the, that, that added pressure of uh you know what am i you know i don't want to be clicking on something or anything like that so e even if you could implement some two-factor authentication on your on your phone Mark? uh i mean for me personally yeah i mean I, well, like I do use it for work, and I work for a two-factor uh, authentication uh, company, mm -hmm. uh, and so I do use it for some applications for work, and pretty much anything I where I'm going to have any sensitive data that is uh, it does I do two-factor with that. Mm -hmm. um, also, the same thing for the uh, very few apps that I have. Uh, so social media apps. I, I do two factor there as well. 
Interesting. Do you think two factor um, has really grown in popularity because of the mobile devices? Do you think that's why you know the company you work for, which you speak very highly of, and uh, that certainly lends a lot of credence uh, to to your company. Do you think that's grown in popularity because of mobile devices? Uh, I, it's kind of hand in hand, at least for us, because um, a lot of times the uh, the thing you have for the two-factor authentication is the phone. Mm. And so you can actually get people to say, hey, look, you can use this uh, app on your own personal phone, and we'll use that for two-factor, and you can convince people to do it because it's a lot lot easier than having that goofy little, you know, dongle or whatever. Right, right. So uh, it's kind of, uh, they've kind of gone uh, together hand in hand. Uh, so changing gears a little bit, in terms of zero-day exploits and mobile devices, are a lot of those geared more towards jailbreaking, or do you see a lot of those like being sold in the black market in terms of being able to use them to profit uh, against people's phones, or are they somewhat kind of dual purpose? The ones that are being sold right now, uh, I haven't seen hardly any. They're being sold. I know that uh, oh, I forget who it was. They just offered a, a that million dollar bounty you, that happened fairly recently. You know what I'm talking about for the uh, jailbreaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah right. uh, the, the drive by jailbreak, um, basically <laughs> million they, dollars they, for visit a website and it roots your phone for you. Right. I mean, it's a drive by. Right. Exactly. Uh, zero diem. Is it was a zero diem? Something. Yeah, like that's that. it. Yeah, that was it. Uh, uh, I think that's, you know, potentially some level of hype. It helps bring attention to their services uh, more than I think they're going to have a be able to make a payout for something like that. That's my guess. I, I mean, I've seen very little of that on the places where they sell stuff. I mean, the desktop is still the big. That's where the the money really is right now. And that's where the ex- and so is kind of as an extension of that. That's where the exploit writers are going, and also that's because where most of the data is located is still in the desktop. Right now, what's on the phones is a lot of times it's copies of some of the same stuff that's uh, uh, found on the desktop and in the uh, enterprise, as far as you know, work-related stuff goes. Sorry, yeah, Dave, I, I would, good, I, I would agree ahead. with that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, but I think it was like in the Verizon DBIR this year, they said it was 0.3 or 0.03% of any type of mobile malware or PHAs um, had some kind of critical security vulnerability. So that really means that the malware authors or the PHA authors, they're out there just using the base libraries that are on the mobile device. Um, so, for example, I'll just tell you a personal story. Um, driving out to uh, Circle City Con with my kid, Mm. And he starts tapping away on his uh, old, his, uh, I think it was like a 5S iPhone that he has, his mom gave him. And he's just banging away, tapping away. I'm like, what are you doing over there? And he says, I'm mining Bitcoin. And I was like, what? You're mining Bitcoin with your finger? He goes, oh, it's just an app. It's called Bitcoin Billionaire. And you see these little coins kind of floating up in the air. And I was like, all right, whatever keeps you busy. So uh, Steve Reagan's a friend of mine. And I, and I showed to Steve Reagan. I'm like, look what he's doing with this app. And he goes, Dude, I bet there's a wallet behind it. <laughs> so and when you think not, about it. And, and not his wallet. And not his wallet. Right, right. Yeah. No. So if you think about it, if they can get 10,000 people to download Bitcoin Billionaire and they start tapping away with all of that um, distributed tapping power instead of computing power, yeah. they might be actually generating some Bitcoin. Absolutely. Is yeah. that, is that yeah. fairly – like how common is that today to have the mobile device be the platform to be the botnet? I think it's rising. It's pretty um, huge. It's getting there. I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's as as big still as PC. But um, so, for example, Z, uh, Zipmo is is pretty common piece of malware that I've come across. Just like Simple Nomad was saying, it was ported from the PC world. It, it was running on Windows Mobile and Symbian and even BlackBerry for a while. But now it's it's pretty popular on Android, and that has a CNC that it's reporting back to, um, typically someplace in in Eastern Europe. But right. Uh, that does not require rooting or any type of critical security vulnerability. Do you see the PC becoming a 
more of a mobile device or the mobile device becoming a PC in, in like when we have this conversation five years from now, is that going to be a moot point? I look at, and the reason I ask that is because I look at the Surface 4. The Surface 4 has, it's a 12 inch screen, it's a tablet, it's got an i7 processor, you can get it with like 8 gigs of RAM. And yeah, it's not joking around, around, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tablet, but it is a desktop PC. Do you see this stuff just merging and this whole conversation is going to be, a lot of it be a moot point? Yeah, I think so. That, I yeah. mean, it just that's the direction it's all heading. We're we're close to that already now. Uh, the first yeah. first indication of it was the iPad. Mm-hmm. I mean, that really was kind of the the very first one of these type things where you could you had this like thing that wasn't quite a laptop that was way bigger than a cell phone, but you could actually uh, make phone calls with the thing. Mm-hmm. Right. If you so. wanted to hold something akin to a book to your head you know you could make phone calls with or use like your know, laptop right there job. yeah like my laptop right there. <laughs> actually i i have a, a another related question <laughs> sure somewhat uh are you guys seeing uh, crossover threats uh when when uh, mobile devices are tethered to pcs and and, and that's a good uh, question Joe. can you uh can you comment on the, on that aspect of, of what what activities out there today crossover devices that are when when devices are tethered to the PCs, are you seeing right. you know threats uh, crossing over where where the PC oh. may affect the mobile device or vice versa? Oh, through bridging, yeah. Why not? Um, if you notice that there's a connection, why not try to use it? Right. I don't mm-hmm. I don't see that too often, but any kind of see that's a part of the problem with or, or sort, some of the security problems with mobile devices. The threats are everywhere. It's not just internal. It's not just external. It's anywhere that that device could go. So whether the device is and Simple Nomad's got a good point. He turns off his Bluetooth. He turns off his Wi-Fi. Do you turn off your NFC? Like any one of those ways to connect and talk to the device could be a threat. So whether it's tethered and you're using it for a hotspot or to transfer data, sure, why not? I mean, I think it was um, it was a black hat in 2013. There was some Chinese researchers that showed how you could take the iPhone, plug it into um, a device which kind of emulated juice jacking, and because it was attached, they were able to get the device's UDID and then drop their developer certificate on it, and then they were able to install their Trojan. So, why not? Mm-hmm. So, so my question is: Go ahead, Aaron. Um, you know, with PCs, it's always targeting the end user. You know, trying to get the end user to install the malware or exploit a vulnerability. With our mobile devices, we have pretty good walled gardens. You know, Apple more so than Android, but they're still. Most users are just getting their applications from the store, so it's you know a vetted process, and there's a certain level of trust. We saw recently with the whole Xcode and Apple Store, um, where the malware authors were targeting the developers to implant their malware to get to the end users. You think we're going to be seeing more of that, where they're going after the developers to infect? Uh, they are in the end users that way rather than targeting the end users directly? I, I don't know if we'd see more of it. I think it will happen again. It's the same thing with like saying let's target Microsoft and uh, try to backdoor their code or you know, something like that. I mean, it's, it may be a little bit more, it's a lot easier, again, with app developers than it would be for the uh, for an OS uh, uh, developer. But uh, I think it's still going to continue to happen. I to me, that was probably more of uh, uh, a, an opportunity they were able to take advantage of more than anything else. Kind of a unique, maybe it may have been a unique situation. <laughs> so, what about the process of vetting apps before uh, they're installed on the fo- on the phone or the mobile device, or as a process for uh, installing them? So, essentially, there's like a rating that's associated with a mobile app before it's installed on the phone. Uh, I know that Blackphone uh, has a model for this. Uh, mm-hmm. In concept, it sounds Te- really great. Technically, Basically, Apple has a model for this. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. like, I yeah. evaluated the code. I've looked at the code. I've determined this app to be really secure, so it gets a higher security rating than, say, the Facebook app, which crashes and wants to gain access to all of my photos and all this other crap. Uh, on my phone and makes me install things like Messenger and just really makes a mess of security on my phone. Like, what's the, um, you know, how can we uh, evaluate these apps and how can we, 
use this as a model and is it a viable model to be able to evaluate and rate these apps in that vetting process? It's a viable model for the uh, black phone because they don't have a huge uh, amount of apps uh, uh, that they've uh, put through this process and they don't have a giant user base. Uh, so it works for them. I it, Will it scale? I don't know. There's what I think approximately one zillion apps now yeah. that exist out there. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, it's not going to scale. I, I just don't see it scaling. Would it, but would it be possible for organizations to at least develop some type of process for evaluating programs? Like a lot of programs that are out there that have vulnerabilities in Microsoft's platform are basically programs that didn't take advantage of the suite of protections that Microsoft can offer. Like they'll, they'll disable S safe SEH or they'll shut off some type of protection that would have stopped a lot of attacks. I mean, couldn't we develop a framework from the way of organizations to just simply look at it and say, you know what, you've disabled safe SEH, you're disabling SLR, you're not doing all these basic security things. Maybe your organization shouldn't be used in our, uh, your, your app shouldn't be used in our organization, or is that even possible? It's great in theory. Yeah, it's, it's a different theory. architecture, right? So um, kind of going back to the question about the rating system, one of the things I, I, when I coach people or kind of give them some advice, if you're going to use a rating system, and let's just kind of pick on the, um, in the Google Play Store, there's these flashlight apps, and Somebody yeah. did some research and showed that, you know, out of the top ten, like eight or nine of them were malware at one point or another. Um, so what you do is, and this is really just a really very simple thing to do. It's not technical. Look at the app ratings. If you see that it's got like a lot of five stars and then it kind of tails off and then there's fewer ones, more than likely it's a safe app. But if you see it kind of tail a lot longer at the bottom in the one stars, um, and look at those reviews, and you're going to see things like. It crashed my phone. It doesn't go to sleep. My phone gets hot. And my battery keeps draining. It doesn't go away. I can't uninstall it. Those are all telltale signs of mobile malware. Oh, shit. Um, I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Why is your phone battery dead? <laughs> Man, it's hot to the touch. One of the five, really? All the five-star reviews are like, super fun time, would recommend to my dog. You're like, what, what, who writes yeah. that? Just the yeah. record, my phone's feeling really cool right now. Yeah. <laughs> Shit, I got to go. We can light that yeah, on fire. Yeah, but Joff, you're usually pretty hot to the touch. Oh, oh baby. Anyway. Wait, get a room. But, but that's the best advice you could give anybody. So just look at those one stars. Five stars are great. Four stars. Look at the one stars. And then if it ever looked like it had the, t the signs of malware, then just stay away from it. You know, use the simple mode, nomad approach. Don't install the app. <laughs> I so, mean, I... So, go, oh, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead Allison. Allison. Yeah. I mean, one of the more frustrating things about using a mobile platform is that you there's a serious trade-off between security and usability and there doesn't seem to be that much middle ground like when we started the interview your response uh when you were talking about your own personal response to security issues was i don't install apps that's essentially saying i don't use my phone for that much um mm -hmm. but when people are trying to use their phone for Oh, say they're underground on the train and they want to pass time or, or they want to talk to their friends using Facebook. Um, they end up giving up these security trade-offs because of the usability issues. Uh, they want to be able to use their phone for something. So, I mean, until we figure out some way to bridge these two different needs, I think we're going to have these problems. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I took the question as literally be what do I personally do? To secure my phone, not what, what do you and the royal we think? Oh, we it's a completely valid approach. Yeah. I agree with you. I think it's a very valid approach. Um, but then it defeats the purpose apps. of being on a mobile platform. Exactly. Apps are great. Apps are fun. The users are apps in control. Apps are shit without the mouse. Right? Wait. Well, are these in control? I mean, it, it's. Uh... <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That was that was George Carlin saying farts are cute, farts are fun. Parts of shit with well, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I have a dog that craps on my rug. Which literally, <laughs> it's like shit with the mess, which is not as fun. <laughs> hey, John, you got a story about so, a cat, right? <laughs> yeah, I need a cat we'll, we'll close tell that out later. tonight with the cat story. I guess. Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think this brings up an, an interesting point where we seem to understand the implications of using many of these applications, and and the potential ramifications of using them is that we just don't use them at all. Uh, it seems like every day we hear a new story about an application, say on Android or iOS 
that is using a service we didn't know about originally. It's turning on Wi-Fi to do Wi-Fi scanning. It's sending back data we didn't know about. It's grabbing our SMS. It's taking our contact list and forwarding onto a marketing agency. So we mm -hmm. seem to have the best understanding oh, of what these opening are. Opening a shell. In our yeah, oh, right. reversing a shell. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And our response is, is logically don't use them. Don't use the full features of what a smartphone is because we are concerned about what they are. But the average person wants to use these applications. In your example, I need to spend time on the train every single day. I want to waste that time. But it, what is the trade-off to the average person who doesn't have an understanding? So where is the onus responsibility? Is, us, is it on us to be louder and say, you need to fix this? Or is it on the companies to actually build applications that are secure? Honestly, I think that there is a third option. Take, for example, when you're running applications on a desktop, when a developer releases a program and say, oh, that program contains a Bitcoin miner uh, that forwards money back to the developer. Well, on a desktop, that sort of stuff gets found out pretty quickly because there's a lot of reverse engineering tools. There's a lot of uh, debugging programs. Uh, there's a lot of network traffic monitoring tools. And when you're running stuff on a desktop, you can very quickly and easily find out a lot of what that program is doing. Um, uh -huh. On a mobile device, it's a lot harder. Mm. And when I hear people talking about mobile programs, it's a lot more of a black box than it is when you're talking about a desktop program. Like when you're looking at a mobile program, we hear recommendations like, oh, look at the reviews, which are totally valid recommendations. But if this is the best tool that we have, if the best tool that we have are one star <laughs> reviews from people that we don't know, and we don't even know their education level. We don't even know how skilled yeah, they are. I mean, you know, Allison, well, you're, you're, I, I think, Allison, you're dead on. I mean, that, that, that to me is an indicator of the immaturity of the defenses we have in the mobile mm. security marketplace Where's Wireshark right now. for my phone? Yeah, it doesn't exist, right? I mean, you, where's uh, a Little Snitch or, you know, you pick any mm. kind of uh, uh, defense. Process Explorer for yeah, my phone? Yeah, you, you just don't have it. So, yeah, but I mean, you know, if you really PC. want to be terrified, set up a proxy and just sniff the traffic through <laughs> from a wireless yeah. access no, point no, and see what no, it's doing. No, no, like, no. Oh, 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 God. Well, I'm interested yeah. to see what, what the guys think about the, the, the panelists. Two, two words. Uh, what, what do you guys think about that in terms of maturity of the <laughs> of the uh, defenses in, in in mobile in general? Uh, well, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, black phone. I, right now, okay. Let me to kind of back up a little bit. Sure. I'll, I'll use my daughter-in-law as an example. Okay. Uh, she, uh, I just finally, I it didn't take a lot of convincing, but she's now on an iPhone as opposed to an Android, and. The other big thing that I kept uh, harping on on to her with her Android and now with the uh, iPhone is keep the thing patched up. Uh, a lot of new improvements come with the, the new OSs. And uh, I mean, there's a huge amount of uh, crap that uh, uh, is still, I mean, most uh, cell phones are not current. Yeah, uh, yep. they're not they're not running current stuff. And do, do, do the provider. Uh, sometimes do the provider. I think a lot of it's the end user as well. I yep. mean, this is something that uh, I mean because I work for a company that does two factor auth, and we have an app that runs. Uh, we see some, you know, anonymized data that comes in off of that phone to say, okay, this is what the OS is. You know, this is what level mm -hmm. it's running at, and. Uh, we even have products now that are going to come up that allow you to say, well, I'm not going to allow a jailbreak phone on my, on my uh, corporate network. I'm hey. not going to allow. Yeah. So some cool stuff like that. So, uh, but nonetheless, you know, how, you know, just looking at that data, uh, most <clears throat> phones are uh, still running outdated software and they're, and therefore they're posing a security risk. And, and that's uh, carrier based. Yeah. It's uh, not all carrier. It, no, it's not all carrier. Some yeah, of the lots. devices in Asia, they're still running like Android 2.2. So you're buying the device at that level. There's really no upgrade path. Oh my God. Um, but I want to go back. There's a fourth option. There's actually a fourth option to this. Um, so it, it's really the users need to participate in their own rescue. The users have always been a problem. Pen testers go after the users, um, and they're easy targets. So to, you know, looking at the star rating, it's not the tool. It's just a process. Um, so the users really need to 
patch. Perfect example right there, Simple Nomad. They need to be a little bit more aware of what they're installing, so they need to look at the reviews. And then when they're actually installing an app, if there's warnings that are glaring, like this app is going to be able to read your text messages, broadcast text messages, um, you know, do whatever it does that you don't want it to do, then don't install it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I had a, or, I had a, question on, a follow-on question on that. Android in particular has the model where they will display all of the different uh, permissions on the device, or at least yeah. attempt to display all the different permissions on the device that an app is requesting. Um, if, if let's let's assume in a in a perfect world for a moment, which should p potentially the twilight zone, that a user is paying attention to those uh, d warnings that are d being displayed. How effective are those warnings, in your opinion? Moderate. So, in my opinion. From a consumer standpoint, they're minimally effective only with somebody who's trained in IT, InfoSec, or just a more sophisticated user. The general population, it's completely ineffective, but that's why I'm kind of banging that drum. The users need to participate in their own rescue. The, on the enterprise side, things like Android for Work, kind of going back to sandboxing, one of the features that it has is IT, before they deploy that app to their, their user base, they get to read through those permissions and they get to decide. So they're better educated than the users. Can they make mistakes? Yes. Are they all at the same level of education? No. But at least it's one person that's deciding for the organization. You got a thousand users, you're going to get a thousand different responses. Have you run into apps that are able to mask um, those warnings in terms of, you know, gain access to, let's say, the wireless NIC uh, and not actually warn the user that get, they're, they're uh, able to do that? I don't believe that's possible, and I could be wrong, because that's coming from the Android Manifest.xml file, yep. and that's a part of what's being built into the APK. And if you're not requesting to use those permissions, then you're not able to make those specific calls. I I've actually, to the intents, I've tried doing that, and it just get through back some kind of error. Okay. So okay. it should it's require some sort of exploit to be able to do that, right? Yep. Yeah. Stage you have, right. You have to remember how right. long it's taken Android to get to actually displaying those warnings. Back then, it was so arcane about when you open an application, it would give you a general understanding. Uh, unless you were actually trained in, in security, you would have no idea of this application. It took a lot of people yelling very loudly for them to even finally get to the point where having a little bit of granularity of what the applications are requesting. Right. But right. then but you have iOS that has well, the, installed the, it. So the, but again, it comes back to the onus responsibility. Is it on the carriers who, or not the carriers, excuse me, the maintainers of the app stores to actually control this, or is it on the users to make themselves more aware? Uh, I, think it's a oh. I think it's a multifaceted issue because you see uh, in the Android space uh, applications that request everything when they don't need everything, <laughs> and the app may be actually um, a uh, flashlight app. Quite, quite benign. It actually might so, be benign. It might, and it might, not, <clears throat> might not be malware. But at the same, the same time, the user, the other part of this is the user, will go ahead and accept it anyway, but the, the not user's knowing not what they've done. Know. They're, they're, so right. so, so wait, wait. does it go back to the app store to, to say, this is a de deny this app because it's requiring permissions outside of what it actually does because it could be harmful to a user who doesn't understand the arcaneness of IT security? So, uh, so kind of take this a different way. You know, we talk about all the things that a user should be aware of, a user should be aware of. What about organizations like Verizon that are starting to track at a, at a completely different level what their users are doing? So you know, like you talk about like zombie cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so, a <laughs> so okay. So we talk about privacy. Who, mm -hmm. What are we trying to protect ourselves against? Are we worried about organized crime, possibly? But what about organizations that are tracking every single website in such a way that you, as a user, fundamentally have little to no control of actually? modifying it or even opting out in the first place. I, mean, we we, I brought up X Keyscore before, and the zombie cookie for Verizon or any other carriers is a perfect example of being able to target specifically individual people on the internet. Yeah. And it all starts with what the carriers or advertising agencies uh, are doing. I mean, you I don't have even a, have to go, go to ahead. classified issues to even run into problems there. Uh, advertising networks, they track information on you, and there are people that end up receiving ads based on very private, very invasive mm -hmm. personal issues that they're dealing with. Um, and these advertising <sighs> networks are the reason why they deal with this. So I have a, a very important update from the chat. Uh, Simple Nomad, you have a comment mm -hmm. from someone who may or may not be a fellow co-worker that says you were way cooler when you had hair. Oh. I, <laughs> I defended yeah. you. I said just when we were talking yeah. about good stuff. I have right? hair. Simple nomad was. I have hair. <laughs> equally as cool with or without hair. What I hair? defended what you. Hair? I just want to put it on record. It's uh, merely about the location of said hair. Look, <laughs> hair is cool. Okay. 
Yeah. Allison <laughs> has beautiful hair. She does. Yeah, she I makes used to have hair lack about hair. I know, right? I used to have hair about her length, so that was, uh, yeah. Indeed. And are, Indeed. are you I'm still just... doing the uh, the Cryptonomicon thing? Oh, yeah. And I have a, a, a new band as well. Nice. Called the Subsumer. Look for that soon. Same, same, style, that same style of music? Uh, prog metal. And I'm doing that one with my son. Oh, Excellent. nice. Excellent. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. So I just looked up the pictures, and I think Simple Nomad looks much better without hair than he did with hair. No, I don't. Allison, I disagree. I disagree. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm so glad. I mean, I think it really depends on how he did his hair. No, this is fantastic, right? That yes, cool. that's, that's <laughs> actually really cool. Everyone with the long him. hair and the bandana looks like he, yeah, that he's, one's he's like a biker. You know what? For you know what? Yeah. No, yeah. dude, you're much better now. Yeah, <laughs> I like the way you look now. Keep it up. Hey, so, I got a picture of Bruce, right next to you is a picture of Bruce Schneier with a comb over. <laughs> that, that is the Which clearly I simple looks that better than that. The ponytail. Anything's the ponytail. better than a comb over. <laughs> so oh, I'm right. It's it is. So tiny. Oh my god. That's what she said. Oh, that's so simple nomad and, and David, I want to ask you both five questions. Oh, are you no. guys ready right. for five questions? <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, yes, you are. You know you are. So we oh, wouldn't get stuck yeah. with this. All right, <laughs> David, you're gonna go first. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, persistent. Advanced threat. No. <laughs> I was, was going to say threat. <laughs> and not so advanced. <laughs> Simple nomad, three words to describe yourself. Totally not indicted. <laughs> yes. I like that. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Simple Come nomad, in. if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Um, I would use the internet. David. I would use serial. <laughs> David, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Don't read this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, what would be your answer to that question? Uh, I don't know. Uh, read enough. David's yep. book instead. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. So, we'll go back in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby. Do you prefer to go first or second? Is there some way that I can be first and second? Yes, absolutely. David. Valid yeah. answer. I don't even want to play that game. Even if it's with Simple Nomad? <laughs> oh, with him, yeah. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go second. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sweet. David, <laughs> choose two celebrities to be your parents. Uh, Robin Williams and uh, Kelly Le Brock from Weird Science. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Score. At first I was sad, and then I got happy. <laughs> and then, Simple then, then he got a boner. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Um, let's see. Uh, Stephen Hawking and... Um, I have no idea. Heidi Klum. Oh, I like that. I like oh, that, too. That was definitely... At least defi it wasn't Angelina Jolie. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. That's true. I mean, we would have accepted Angelina Jolie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, we would Because we have mommy issues. And David and Mark, thank you very much oh my gosh. Uh, for both of you for joining us for our Security Weekly 10-year anniversary show and talking about mobile security and privacy. Yes, and uh, David, I want you to – you have a very special plug. Uh, we do these in support of various charities. This show is in support of EFF. Please go to EFF.org, click the Donate button. And you also have a very special uh, charity uh, and an eBay auction, which is ending in a day and a half or so, correct? Link's in the show notes. Yeah. Link's in the show notes, and also I held up the link. Yes, so we won this. Uh, Hack for Kids won this black badge yes. to DerbyCon in the scavenger hunt or the Derby cake, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And um, we are now have it up on auction for eBay to help support what we're doing with kids to make them the next super cyber warriors. Yes, I said cyber. And great, uh, great. so uh, please place your bid. I'll drink, I think to I'll drink to that too uh, after we get off the air. Um, but uh, please pay, place a bid. I think when I last looked at it, is it twenty three hundred and seventy five dollars still? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and you know what? That's 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 a bargain, considering it what uh, HFC mm -hmm. nailed for two black badges that seven thousand dollars a piece. Each, oh, yeah, wow. that was incredible. Yeah, so please but, help so. us, help the kids. If you don't bid, you hate children. It's for the children. Think of the children. And you know what? If I had five grand right now, I'd drop five grand on that in a heartbeat. 
You, you have an Amex card with an unlimited balance? I do, but then I got to pay it off. No. <laughs> yeah, so get a month. Pay. Yeah, get yeah, some friends. Smart. You can share the badge. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> No, but well, ser- seriously, thanks a lot. That's thanks a for helping us uh, with that. Uh, yeah, a, a great, that. a great charity and uh, great things to do, and uh, go be it, especially if you have yeah. David and Mark. Wanna... Thank you very much uh, for coming on the you show. Bet. It was awesome talking with you both. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back, and things are probably going to get even more ridiculous <laughs> than they have all day because yeah. we've been drinking oh, yes. all day. Oh my god! And the only thing left on the docket today <laughs> is. To do some hacker trivia, talk some security news, and destroy some laptops. Destroy some laptops, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait let me get the stickers off we them first. Laptops. Yes, yes. Yeah, we cool have plenty off. of those. So we're going to take a short break. Come back, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for having us. Uh, Cheers, guys. Thank you.